I'm a vegetarian. I don't make a big deal about it, for a couple of reasons. First, I assume it's not of importance or interest to anyone but me. And second, I'm not really a vegetarian. Not strictly. I don't eat meat six days out of the week. On Saturday, I allow myself a cheat day where I do eat meat. Although sometimes I'll eat fast food, and who really knows how much actual meat there is in an Arby's roast beef sandwich. Could be none. Doesn't matter. It tastes like a bite out of an angel's ass. I don't give a shit what's in it. Anyway, despite my somewhat lax commitment to it, I do think vegetarianism is better than meat eating. It's healthier, and not really the point, but it can be quite a bit cheaper too. Meat is expensive. And it's much easier for me to justify morally. Obviously, that moral component isn't that important to me, or I wouldn't allow myself a meat-eating cheat day. And let's be honest, if moral reasons were truly the foundation of the thing, I wouldn't just be a vegetarian, I'd be a vegan. Since vegans not only avoid eating meat, they avoid eating any animal products and try to avoid taking part in any kind of animal exploitation. That's why I think many fans just kind of assume that in the fictional utopian society of the Federation, home to most of the heroes of the various incarnations of Star Trek, veganism is, if not the rule, at least the prevailing norm. They're better people than we are. They're the keepers of the bright, hopeful future. Of course they're vegans. But are they? And I'm not just talking about individuals we've met throughout the many Star Trek shows and films. I'm talking about Federation society as a whole. So, before diving into this, I should define some terms, because veganism can be a complex subject, and it means different things to different people. Generally, when people talk about veganism, they're referring to one of two main categories. The first category is dietary veganism. That's the simpler version, where you maintain a diet that excludes all animal products. No meat, no dairy, no eggs, no food cooked in animal fat, no ingredients derived from an animal, nothing that comes from an animal, period. There's also ethical veganism, which takes the underlying philosophy of dietary veganism, that it's wrong to exploit animals or to benefit from their exploitation and suffering, and applies it more broadly. Ethical vegans seek to avoid participating in the exploitation of animals, including their fellow humans, as much as possible in all facets of life. I'm going to look at the Federation through the lens of both dietary and ethical veganism, but before I get started, one final caveat. As I mentioned before, I am not a vegan. So if any of you are vegans and you see that I've gotten something wrong, please don't hesitate to correct me in the comments. Now then, let's begin with that first category. Is a vegan diet the norm in the Federation? This is kind of a challenging question to answer. Star Trek shows are primarily interested in telling us stories, not in teaching us about the dietary customs of their imaginary societies. So whatever information we have about said dietary customs is what we've been able to pick up along the way. In Star Trek Enterprise, the series set the earliest in the franchise's timeline, veganism definitely doesn't seem to be the norm. In the first episode, Captain Archer and Trip have red meat for dinner, something of which vegetarian T'Pol vocally disapproves. Meanwhile, T'Pol's vegetarian diet is treated as something to be accommodated. Trip even gently teases her about it, saying he can't wait to see her tackle the spare ribs. In the season 3 episode Carpenter Street, during a time travel adventure in the 20th century, Archer orders a burger at a drive through I'm sure there are other examples of characters eating meat, but the point is, eating meat is obviously something humans do, something that is considered normal. True, Enterprise is set prior to the founding of the Federation, so I suppose technically it falls outside the scope of this video, but it centers on characters who are mostly from Earth, and the Earth of Enterprise doesn't appear all that different from the Earth we see in shows that take place a century or two later. War and poverty and disease have been overcome, 
but animals are still treated as a food source, and as a rule, the human characters on the show don't seem the least bit bothered by it. I should note that not all the meat eaten by the characters of Star Trek Enterprise is acquired the old-fashioned way. The ship is also equipped with a protein resequencer that can apparently produce meat products like chicken sandwiches and meatloaf. It's not too much of a leap, then, to assume that this protein resequencer technology is the basis for the food synthesizers that are aboard ships on shows set during the era of Star Trek the Original Series. Given its current state of advancement in the real world, it seems all but a sure thing that residents of the 23rd century will have lab-grown meats that are close to, perhaps even indistinguishable from, their natural counterparts. But we're not talking about the real 23rd century that will be in a couple hundred years. We're talking about the imaginary 23rd century that has been on TV and in the movies for the last several decades. And starships in that 23rd century are equipped with food synthesizers. And while various scenes in Star Trek the original series and Star Trek Discovery, the first two seasons of which are set during roughly the same era, suggest that food synthesizers are capable of producing things like ice cream, blueberries, and the aforementioned and apparently very popular chicken sandwiches, it's hard to tell exactly what the limitations of the technology are supposed to be. Can the food synthesizers aboard Kirk's Enterprise make a decent steak? Or does someone still have to slaughter a cow first? Like I said, it's hard to tell because, as far as I know, no Star Trek show has a scene where a character stops and explains how a food synthesizer works and what kinds of food it can and cannot make. And by the way, that's a good thing. I don't want a Star Trek show to have that scene, because outside of admittedly fun, nerdy discussions like this, I don't give a shit about how food synthesizers are supposed to work. I care about stories, and a story that stops dead in its tracks to have a scene where someone drops a bunch of exposition about food synthesizers is probably a story that would be better off without that scene. In Star Trek The Next Generation, when someone comes aboard the ship who isn't familiar with their technology, there's sometimes a line of dialogue from Worf or Riker or whoever shows them to their room where they say, and if you get hungry, just ask the magic food hole for some food. It'll make you whatever you want. And that's it. And that's all it needs to be. Speaking of the magic food holes, those are replicators, and they're apparently a lot more sophisticated than the food synthesizers of the earlier generation. They can make a steak, or pretty much anything else you ask for. And while there might be the odd line about how replicated food just isn't the same, for the most part, food from a replicator seems pretty authentic compared to non-replicated versions. So that must mean eating food made from animal products is a thing of the past unheard of in the Federation of the 24th century, right? Not exactly. In the second season episode, Times Squared, Riker makes what he calls an omelet, but what looks like plain old scrambled eggs. No disrespect. I love scrambled eggs, but as I am often reminded, precision matters. Riker's omelet is made using eggs he picked up during a recent visit to a starbase, and he prepares them on a skillet over a hot plate. This is presented as somewhat unusual, a special occasion, which it probably would be on a ship equipped with magic food holes in virtually every room. But no one balks for a second at eating the eggs. Only Worf seems to actually like them, but nobody seems to have any problem with consuming an animal product. A few years later, in the season four episode The Wounded, we get a scene of Miles and Keiko O'Brien sharing a meal. Miles isn't thrilled with the food, so he volunteers to cook next time, promising to introduce his wife to delicacies such as scalloped potatoes, mutton shanks, and oxtails and cabbage. Ultimately, he replicates a potato casserole, but that's not really the point. When Keiko is initially reluctant to try the food O'Brien suggests, he reassures her that it'll be great. Although, he adds, he'll have to use the replicator. He can't cook from scratch like his mother used to. Keiko's like, your mother cooked? She handled real meat? O'Brien's like, yeah, you bet your plankton loaf-loving ass she did. 
From this exchange, I think it's safe to assume that even on 24th century Earth, at what seems to be the height of the enlightened and utopian federation civilization, eating meat and other products made from animals is still practiced, at least by some. Perhaps it's no longer the norm, but it's still done, and it's still tolerated. O'Brien doesn't give the impression his mother was part of an illegal livestock operation or anything. Beginning in its third season, the setting of Star Trek Discovery shifts to the 32nd century, the latest time period in which any Star Trek show to date has been set. In the season three episode Forget Me Not, Captain Saru hosts a dinner party that may or may not include meat dishes. It's kind of hard to tell. And for our purposes, it really doesn't matter, since presumably all the food is replicated anyway. Later in the season, during the episode There is a Tide, Emerald Chain leader Osira remarks that an apple doesn't taste quite right, and Starfleet Admiral Vance explains that it's probably because the apple, like all of their food, is, quote, made of our shit, meaning their replicators break down waste into basic matter and then use those molecules to make other things. So the apple is made of shit, but only in the same sense that the coffee I'm drinking is potentially made of dinosaur semen. Mm. That T-Rex must have been in love. So, based on what we've seen in the TV series and films, and what we've seen in the TV series and films is, officially, all there is, because books and comics and video games and such aren't considered canon, and it's all made up to begin with, dietary veganism is not a universal or even a standard practice in the Federation until, possibly, sometime after the 24th century. The people of the Federation we see in the 32nd century do seem to be dietary vegans. It's implied that all of their food is replicated, seemingly as a result of the Federation having significantly contracted since the TNG era, and having to be much more mindful of how it manages its resources. But before that, the eating of meat, real meat, made from butchered animals and other animal products, is clearly still legal, tolerated, and happening. Given that, perhaps it's redundant to examine the Federation in terms of ethical veganism. Dietary veganism is not a sufficient condition for ethical veganism, but it is a necessary one. If you're not a dietary vegan, you're not an ethical vegan either. But I think it's still worth looking at Federation society through that lens, because if the Federation truly lived up to its stated ideals, it would have to be an ethically vegan society, wouldn't it? And if it's not, what does that say about the kind of society it actually is? Once again, I think it's important to remind ourselves that we're talking about the fictional world of Star Trek here, not our real world. We can and should draw lessons about our real world from the world depicted in Star Trek. That, to a very significant degree, is the point of Star Trek. But the imaginary society of the Federation differs significantly from our own in terms of its capabilities and its limitations, which means when we're judging whether or not it's an ethical society, we can have different expectations and make different demands. In the real world, ethical veganism is a lot more complicated than it presumably would be in the Federation of the 23rd or 24th century. Ethical consumption of anything is virtually impossible. It's easy and comforting to our personal consciences to seek to live as ethical vegans and declare that our society should be an ethically vegan one as well, but while vegans don't directly harm animals by using them as a food source, many of the agricultural practices used to maintain plant-based food sources can and do harm animals by altering or destroying their habitats. Perhaps these practices can be altered to avoid doing that harm, and if they can be, they should be, but that will take time. And that's just one example of a complication. We also have to consider the exploitation of human workers that takes place in the production of plant-based foods. Remember, ethical veganism seeks to reduce or eliminate exploitation of all animals, including humans. 
We live in a capitalist society where commerce is often underregulated, where, especially in my country, the United States, organizations created to fight for the rights of workers, such as labor unions, have seen their power and influence dwindle over the last 50 years or so. Ridding our society of that kind of exploitation is going to be a big job, to say the least. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try or that incremental improvements toward that larger goal aren't worth pursuing, they very much are, but realizing that goal is a lot more complicated than simply saying everybody should be a vegan. And to be fair, from what I can tell, many if not most vegans know this. But in the Federation, it doesn't seem nearly that complicated. The Federation, and particularly Earth, is a utopia. There is no poverty. There is no hunger. There is no money, for the most part, after a certain point. I did a whole other video about that a while back. Resources are plentiful. There's clean energy. Replicator technology can produce all kinds of food, meat, veggies, those brightly colored food cubes they serve at that reception and journey to Babel, whatever you want. It sure seems like a civilization advanced enough to do away with animal exploitation altogether. And yet, O'Brien's mom cooked with meat. Riker gets some eggs at a starbase. The menu at Cisco's in New Orleans doesn't seem to be vegan. I suppose those shrimp and oysters could be replicated, but I wouldn't bet on it. This seems inconsistent with the values of the Federation, but it's not inconsistent with the behavior we've seen over and over from Federation citizens throughout the history of the franchise. Time and time again, we see Star Trek characters displaying attitudes toward animals that are, if not unethical, at least no more enlightened than attitudes in our own comparatively unenlightened present day. A recent example is the initial treatment of Ripper, the giant space tardigrade in the first season of Star Trek Discovery. Lieutenant Stamets discovers that the tardigrade is essential to operating the ship's experimental spore drive, but Every use of the drive leaves the creature more and more debilitated. If forced to continue interfacing with the spore drive, eventually the tardigrade will die. The characters on the show recognize that this is a problem, that it's wrong to use the tardigrade in this way, and work to find a way to use the spore drive without the tardigrade, but until they figure out that workaround, they continue to exploit and harm the tardigrade. The solution they ultimately find, Stamets injecting his own body with some of the tardigrade's DNA to allow him to interface with the spore drive himself, is born just as much from desperation as from ethical concern. The tardigrade collapses during a crisis where the spore drive is needed to move the ship to safety, and Stamets is forced to improvise. Now, obviously, we, the audience, are supposed to recognize that the way the tardigrade is being used is wrong, and Stamets seems to regret his actions at the end of the episode. However, it's not the end of the tardigrade story arc, but the beginning that is the most relevant to our subject. Once the tardigrade is found to be able to interface with the spore drive, it is pressed into that service with hardly a second thought. And furthermore, we learn that before it was brought to Discovery, the tardigrade was also used by the crew of the USS Glenn to operate its spore drive. Two separate Starfleet crews find that their new piece of technology needs to harm an animal in order to work, and they both immediately go for it. True, these episodes take place in the larger context of a war between the Federation and the Klingons. Desperate times call for desperate measures and all that. But... The ease and quickness with which the characters accept the suffering of this animal as being necessary for their purposes suggests a society that views its commitment to the rights and quality of life of animals as optional, a luxury that can be discarded should the need arise. There are other more benign examples of people from the Federation exploiting animals. One of the more prominent ones is Livingston the fish who lives in Captain Picard's ready room. Pet ownership is a topic of some debate among ethical vegans, with some believing it's wrong for a human to assert ownership over an animal under any circumstances. But 
Regardless of where one comes down on that issue, the tank in which Livingston, a red lionfish, lives does seem rather small for a fish of his size. Patrick Stewart, himself a passionate advocate for animal rights, strongly objected to Captain Picard's keeping of Livingston, arguing that a man as ethical and enlightened as Picard is typically shown to be would not use a captive animal as an ornament to spruce up his office. Stewart believed Picard's displaying of Livingston in the ready room contradicted one of the core messages of the series, that it's important to recognize and respect the dignity of all life forms. All of this is not to say that the Federation is entirely incompatible with the principles of ethical veganism or that none of the characters seem to care about animal rights. Quite the contrary. Maybe the best example of people from the Federation displaying an enlightened attitude toward animals comes in the movie Star Trek IV The Voyage Home. When Kirk and his crew find a mysterious alien probe wreaking havoc on Earth, Spock chides McCoy for assuming the signal sent out by the probe is meant for humanity. There are other forms of intelligence on Earth, Spock says. Only human arrogance would assume the message must be meant for man. But, and here's the crucial point, after that reminder from Spock, no one on Kirk's crew questions or scoffs at the idea that there are other intelligent animals on Earth for the rest of the movie. They figure out that the message is actually meant for humpback whales, they travel back in time to find some whales, since they're extinct in the 23rd century, and when they find some whales, Spock mind melds with one just like he would with any other character. And through the mind meld, Spock asks the whales for help. They don't just beam the whales up and time warp home, they explain the situation and obtain the consent of the whales first. The intelligence, agency, and inherent value of the animals is respected by all of the protagonists. That, along with the story's cautionary element, the human-driven extinction of the whales being the cause of the crisis in the 23rd century, humanity's own short-sighted disregard for the well-being of other creatures coming back to bite it in the ass, makes Star Trek IV the most representative of the values of ethical veganism of any adventure in the franchise. At least as far as I, a layman to the ways of veganism, can tell. We find another more recent example of Star Trek espousing values compatible with ethical veganism in the character of Cleveland Booker on Star Trek Discovery. Book has the ability to telepathically connect to plants and animals, and is a dedicated conservationist. Before meeting Michael Burnham and the Discovery crew, he spent years protecting endangered species from poachers. He also has a deep emotional bond with Grudge, his gigantic cat, who he refers to frequently and unironically, and not incorrectly, as a queen. Technically, Book and his home planet of Quajon are not members of the Federation, but through them, the show reminds us that all life is connected, and that our fates are inextricably intertwined with those of the other forms of life with whom we share our planet, and perhaps even our universe. Recognizing the inherent value of other creatures, including our fellow humans, and striving to avoid exploiting them or causing them to suffer is at the heart of veganism. And it's at the heart of Star Trek, too. To the best of my recollection, the term vegan is never used to describe the guiding philosophy of the Federation, but the term would seem a good fit to describe the intentions of those who hold that philosophy, if not always their actions. Sometimes we Star Trek fans get so attached to the aspirational side of the Federation that we forget about the rest of it. True, a huge part of the appeal of Star Trek is that it shows us a bright, optimistic future. A future we might achieve someday, in some form, if we can put aside our differences, overcome our prejudices, get control of our self-destructive tendencies, and learn to take care of each other. But in addition to showing us who we could be, Star Trek also shows us who we are. And who are we? We're members of a civilization that has come a long way, but still has a long way to go. We've managed to become less destructive in some ways and unfathomably more destructive in others. 
We are the people represented by, reflected by, the Federation. We carry with us the potential to live by enlightened, just, humane values, and we also carry the potential to destroy ourselves and everything we touch. The trick is to recognize our shortcomings and to carry on the struggle to overcome them, always improving, always finding new ways in which we need to improve. Some might call that veganism. To others, it's just the human adventure. Continuing. I want to thank Yellow Cap Query for commissioning this video and for making sure that if I made a video about veganism in Star Trek, it would be about more than just what people ate. Yellow Cap, I hope I did an okay job with this one. Commissions are currently closed, but when I reopen them, I will surely let you all know. In the meantime, if you want to support this channel, you can make regular monthly donations by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Steve Shives or becoming a channel member by clicking the join button, or you can make a one-time donation via PayPal or Venmo. Links to all of that are in the video description. I'll be back in a few weeks with the next Regulation Trek Actually video, Why Keiko O'Brien is Actually Not So Bad, and another commissioned Trek video not long after that, and a whole bunch of videos about other stuff between now and then. Thanks so much to all of you for watching, and I'll see you next time.